And welcome to the Rob Call Bottom Up Show, sponsored by opednews.com, available on Pacifica Radio, Progressive Radio Network, iTunes, Google Podcasts, uh, SoundCloud, and more. Uh, my guest for this show is Cecil, Cecil Bothwell. He's an award-winning investigative reporter, the, the author of Prince of War, Billy Graham's Crusade for a Holy Christian Empire, and nine other books, and his website is CecilBothwell.com, C-E-C-I-L-B-O-T-H-W-E-L-L.com. Welcome to the show. Happy to be here. So, you just wrote a kind of an obituary for Billy Graham. Uh, yep, I, I wrote, actually wrote an obituary for him starting in about 2010, knowing that he, was, he would pass eventually. And based on my research on my book, and the reason I did that, well, for one, most outlet, most news outlets pre-write obits for famous people. They have a whole file. Of, I mean, if you're in Wikipedia, they probably have an obit written for you at this point. Wow. And then they update it on the morning or the day that you die. So the, the information I had gathered previously, and then I updated it to send it out on the day that he uh, actually passed. So you wrote an article, Billy Graham and the Gospel of Fear, and you wrote, Billy Graham left behind a United States government in which religion plays a far greater role than before he intruded into politics in the 1950s. The shift from secular governance to in God we trust can be laid squarely at this minister's feet. Well, I think it's, I found it to be interesting that before Graham showed up on the national scene, presidents never ended their speeches with God bless America. Uh, that was a new thing that started happening, uh, not even with Truman, although uh, Graham made sure he got into Truman's White House. He was always seeking access to the White House, contrary to what we hear that presidents invited him. He was always, there's a list of emails and letters trying to get in to see presidents. But it was after that anti-communist shift that occurred, Joe McCarthy era, Joe McCarthy who, who uh, Graham supported. In fact, Graham excoriated the Senate for censuring McCarthy. Um, but Graham held the first uh, revival on the steps of the, of the Capitol. He was part of the movement to put in God we trust on our money to put uh, one nation under God into the Pledge of Allegiance. He created the prayer breakfast, the presidential prayer breakfast. He really was the first minister to successfully intrude religion into American government. Who? Where did, where did he fit into the rise of the evangelical movement? Well, he was an evangelical Baptist, uh, so he, that was his milieu. Uh, he later well, maybe, let me be clear the, the rise of the political influence of the evangelical movement right well as i said starting in the early 1950s he began to intrude into the public conversation and he he made up to all the presidents along the way and really when it really shifted politically was when nixon was running for re-election and Graham turned over all of his, um, his uh, connections, all of his contact lists from, the, from his crusades to the Nixon campaign. That was a, a real key turning point there. Um, he also worked uh, Reagan, who, Reagan, who had been uh, essentially agnostic in his public announcements up until Reagan ran, uh, Graham drew him into the Southern Baptist Convention and got uh, Reagan to start preaching or start accepting uh, the embrace of the evangelical Christians. So it was growing during that time. There was no particular point. Uh, during the Kennedy, uh, Nixon Kennedy election in 1960, Graham with Norman Vincent Peale pushed the anti Catholic. Uh, movement. They, they worked from Europe at that time uh, with information being sent to the U.S. that if Kennedy became president, he would owe his allegiance to the Pope. And Kennedy famously took down that with a very famous speech in which he 
pointed out that he was going to be the American president and so forth, and pretty much uh, overcame that anti-Catholic movement. But Graham was very much involved with that, as I say, with Norman Vincent Peale, and they worked from Switzerland at that point. Wow. You know, <clears throat> you talk about how uh, Graham really bamboozled the mainstream media with their full help and cooperation. So maybe it wasn't bamboozled. They, uh, the, the, the impression that the world got of Graham was very different with the help of the mainstream media than who he really was, uh, starting with his conversation with Richard Nixon uh, about Jews. Yeah, that was what triggered my interest. Up until 2002, I was aware of Graham, and who couldn't be? He appeared on Time magazine more than any other figure, over 60 times at least on the cover of Time. And I'm sure he'll be there again this week. Um, <clears throat> but I hadn't paid much attention until a Nixon tape was released, a transcript of a tape was released, of a conversation in the Nixon White House in which Graham was trashing Jews, uh, saying that Jews were the problem in America, that satanic Jews were taking down America, that they were responsible for pornography in America. And ominously, I thought, and this was leading up to the 1972 election during the, when the um, Watergate thing was boiling up, he said to Nixon, maybe we can do something about that problem after the election. And I, that hit me really hard. I thought, whoa, doing something about a Jewish problem has a very bad history in the world. And that was an AP story that I read in my local paper. It was only a couple of paragraphs. But having been a reporter for over 15 years at that point, I knew that an AP two-paragraph story probably had more behind it. And Graham immediately apologized and said that wasn't what he believed. Well, okay, there's two things there. First of all, I wondered what else was said. And secondly, how a belief seems to be offered. We just, we just uh, lost you. Just lost you for a second. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, you, you said there were two things that Graham said? Yeah, there were two points there that, that caught my attention. One was when he disavowed the conversation, he said that what he said about Jews was not what he believed. And that seemed odd to me that a person who, whose whole stance is belief would, and who's supposedly counseling presidents would tell a president something he didn't believe. Yeah. That seemed odd. And so I obtained first the transcript and then the tape of that conversation from the archives. And it wasn't a brief conversation as presented in the news. It sounded in the news like it was a, a, a few sentences. It was an hour and a half conversation, and Graham led the conversation, and furthermore, 20 minutes of it were redacted. Now, why would a conversation with a minister and a president have a redacted 20 minutes? That really piqued my interest. And so I spent the next five years looking into what Graham had actually said to presidents, according to every source I could dig up. All the different presidents, biographies, autobiographies, uh, information at the presidential libraries, at the Martin Luther King Center, at Wheaton College, which is where Graham's archives are stored, Wheaton College in Illinois. Um, interestingly, he's sealed most of his archives for 25 years after he dies. So we won't know a lot until I'm dead. <laughs> And you put it together in a book, all this research. Right. I had three interns working for me. I hired uh, an investigator in Washington who worked the Nixon archives for me because the Nixon library hadn't opened yet. So Nixon And Nixon had some of the most complete records because he taped everything. And all, all kinds of amazing things came up. For instance, uh, well, in fact, the reason for the title of the book, The Prince of War, is that what I learned over the whole span is that from Truman forward, Graham advocated for war. He urged Truman into Korea. He urged Eisenhower into what was then French Indochina and later Vietnam. He urged, he wasn't too keen. He and Kennedy had a diffident relationship after, after him trying to keep Kennedy out of office, and Kennedy knew that. But he urged Johnson on in, in Vietnam. In fact, Johnson's biggest 
bombing campaign in Vietnam was called Rolling Thunder, taken directly from Billy Graham's theme song for his crusades. He urged Nixon on in Vietnam. Uh, kind of a mixed relation with Carter, and there wasn't much war going on right then. But when Reagan got in, he, he, he finagled to get arms sales to Saudi Arabia. Um, and then under G.H.W. Bush, he claimed to have been sitting next to Bush when the bombs started falling in the first Gulf War. Uh, he, he made a point of that in, in his own, in Billy Graham's autobiography. Well, when G.H.W. Bush wrote his autobiography, he didn't mention Graham being there, and later a videotape came out of the presidential aides sitting around when the bombing started, and Graham was nowhere in sight. But you've just so far given at least two examples of Graham being a liar. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, most of the information available about Graham is from Billy Graham's own publishing sources. He's flooded the world with books by him and about him, and it's hard to find information. For instance, in, when I just published this uh, kind of co counter obituary, uh, a minister of my acquaintance said, oh, no, no, no. Uh, he, I, I pointed out that he wasn't close with King, and this minister said, oh, no, he, was, he, he worked with King, and he sent me a, a source, and the source was from the Billy Graham Evangel Evangelistic Association. What I couldn't find in all of my research, and this was a sidebar to his war, is anything that suggested that he worked with King or that King approved of, of Graham. In fact, one of the things I stumbled on is it seems to me that the letter from Birmingham jail, um, Martin Luther King's very famous missive from the jail, was almost certainly directed at Billy Graham because he was, he was complaining about the, the middle of the road ministers who said, wait a little, wait a little, uh, just be patient. And that was exactly the message that, that uh, Graham was delivering through the civil rights era. It was always, we need to do something about it. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll acknowledge that, but it's always be patient, be patient. Now you, you cite in the intro to your book uh, that uh, he founded his own media conglomerate of magazine, radio, television, and film production, which was the precursor of Focus on the Family, the 700 Club, PTL, and the widely influential Left Behind series. So you're not saying he created them, you're saying his work set up for those things. Right, he set the example. He started out in radio. Um, he was a radio minister early on in uh, the Chicago area and in Minneapolis. And then he joined the Crusade for Christ and, and began to turn that into a, a media distribution. And then he set up his own motion picture company and began to distribute it that way. And then of course his crusades were always broadcast. So he set the example of religious uh, media in, in the country and in the world. And, I, and to my mind, it looked like the others who came after were seeing how successful he was and were following in his footsteps. Yeah, it, you also, you actually go further in your book than you said here. You said that it, it, it seems that Graham did more to abet segregation than to end it, actively opposing Martin Luther King's use of civil disobedience while endorsing aggressive police tactics and punitive laws. And that ties together what you wrote in your article, talking about uh, his attitude towards government and authority and how he would cite Bible passage to say that people must obey authority and the government. Talk about patriarchal authoritarianism. Yeah, as, I, as I've noted in that article and elsewhere, you know, the Bible is a real a sketchy source, in my view, when you, especially when you look at, at pieces that appear to have been added later. You know, the, by the time the Bible was published, it, the, Christianity had become a government function. I mean, it was, it, was, it was the authorized religion in some places. And so for the, for the words to read that governments are established by God, and therefore we owe our allegiance to governments. And that's actually in the Bible. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that's the, that's the context in which Graham quotes it. And it gets really weird. What, during the Reagan era, he used his government connections to go to the Soviet Union. 
because there was a pretty good Christian population in the Soviet Union, and Graham was always eager to, to contact those people. And during his motorcade in Moscow, a woman hung up a banner, a pro-Christian banner, and was promptly arrested. And he endorsed the government for arresting her because she should have seen that in the Bible, that she owes her allegiance to the government. I mean, it, that is perverse. Is this, something that, is this something that is also talked about and used uh, within the modern evangelical community? Oh. Certainly so. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's why he opposed uh, civil disobedience. He endorsed Nixon's uh, coming down on Vietnam protesters. He's, he's always been very, very much in favor of whatever government, and in any government. Uh, he, he supported dictators in South America. Uh, he, he worked with the FBI openly, I mean, it was known, and he also was worked with the CIA covertly. And I, I established a, a strong factual record for that in my book. I can't, I mean, I can't go into the footnotes right now, but anybody who wants to see it, I, my, my book is totally grounded in sources. It's not, it's not my imagination. And the book is The Prince of War, Billy Graham's Crusade for a Holy Christian Empire. So that's that subtitle, Holy Christian Empire. What are you what are you talking about there? Crusade for a Holy Christian Empire. What he said uh, specifically, at least a few times, and what it's clear from his actions that he believed in, is that American armies would Christianize the world. That that they were literally the Christian soldiers who would Christianize the world. And therefore, especially interventions in the Muslim Middle East, in the Buddhist uh, Southeast Asia, were, were God's work. And I really think, I don't think he was um, necessarily aggressively militaristic, but he was evangelically interested in, our, in, in the Christian armies. And his son, Franklin, has carried that on. Uh, even there was a, um, a ban on sending Bibles into the Mideast during the Mideast War, uh, during the first Mideast, the first uh, Iraqi War. Uh, Franklin Graham shipped Bibles in there, uh, written in Arabic or whatever the language was, uh, through Samaritan's Purse, his, his charity, uh, trying to convert Iraqis to uh, Christianity. So it's been very much their intent, and they try to follow the army everywhere. Well, I, you know, I have a theory. I'm, I'm, I'm particularly concerned about the couple hundred million indigenous people left in the world. And my theory is that those people should be guarded and protected from missionaries and loggers and people exploring for energy. And they should be ordered to shoot to kill. <laughs> yeah, and one of the in one of the chapters in the book, and I, I I'm afraid I, I it's I haven't read it lately, so I don't have the specifics. But I'd urge people to check it out. One of the groups that Graham worked with in South America used light planes to fly over when the oil interests were trying to move into an area. I think it was in Venezuela, if memory serves. It's either Venezuela or Brazil, but the light planes flew over indigenous villages, dropped candy and goodies in the center, and so people rushed in to find out what had been dropped, and they came back over and bombed them. It was part of depopulating areas that the oil companies wanted to move into, and the oil company executives were big supporters of the Grand Crusade. Wait, Graham was involved in these bombings? I, could I say that he personally was involved? His organization was connected to organizations that successfully cleared out indigenous people for the oil companies whose executives were supporting the Billy Graham Evangel Evangelical Association. Follow the money. I mean, yeah. Wow. It's heinous to say that Graham was personally aware. I don't know. It's a huge organization. I mean, it could have been underlings. You know, I mean, you know what I mean? I, you can't, there, there are no paperwork on that. Yeah, he might not have wanted to know about that. Right. But he was in the same areas working with the CIA and passing information to Kennedy uh, during that period of time. Um, 
to, to that extent, he worked with Kennedy. He, he provided information on supposed communist organizations in, in Latin America. You know, during the 60s and into the 70s, there was communist or socialist organizing for the poor people in those countries who very clearly, say Nicaragua, uh, the, the corporatists that we had helped install were not being kind to the, to the populace. And, and the communist insurgencies were very popular. I mean, that, that's true. But um, Graham used his ministers, his, his religious connections in those countries to send information to the U.S. government about what was going on among the populace. I wonder how much of that happens now with other evangelical uh, ministers operating overseas. It's hard to know, it's hard to know. Um, there was the, one of the same groups that he worked with was part of the Iran-Contra connection. Uh, when Reagan was peddling arms, let's see, it was arms to the Contras in Nicaragua uh, that were, being paid for by, it was Iran? Yeah, Iran was paying for them. And in, in exchange, Reagan was going easy. I mean, that's, that's a tangle that I didn't really get deeply into. But, yeah, that was back, Ollie North was involved in that. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 You know, I, I've long felt that Graham was a pretty evil guy. At, at, at best, he was very self-serving. Um, he, he bragged once, for instance, that he had never paid for a hotel room or a suit in his life. Um, you know, he, he claimed to live in a, in a humble log cabin in Montreat. He didn't mention the indoor pool. He didn't mention the helipad. Uh, he didn't mention his golf villa. Um, he, he pretended that he didn't take much, but when you're head of a a huge nonprofit with hundreds of millions of dollars, you don't have to pay for much. <laughs> you know, I mean, churches are exempt around here. In fact, here in Buncombe County, North Carolina, where I live, a great swath of property is tax exempt under the Billy Graham Association. Um, it's, he, he's deeply invested, he was deeply invested in property here. And you were, lot, you were managing editor of the local newspaper. Uh, local weekly, Mountain Express. Yeah. yeah. What kind of relationship did you have with Graham and his ministry? Well, that's an interesting thing. I, I was not the publisher. I was the managing editor. And, um, and then I stepped down as managing editor. I, I, I really didn't like managing artists and writers. Uh, <laughs> what I liked was editing and, uh, and writing. And so I became the senior reporter for the paper. You can imagine in a small town, there's your multitask. I was also the garden editor. But um, during, uh, during I was uh, an investigative reporter during the years I was working on the Graham book. And each year, weekly papers have a best of contest. Uh, you know, they get the, vo the readers to vote on the best restaurant you know, all those kind of things. And of course, it's an, it's an advertising ploy. I mean, you know, you, I mean, that's the reason they do it. But to make it look a little more serious, they also have the best newspaper reporter, the best uh, new TV reporter, the best, you know, I mean, those kind of things. And for three years in a row, I was tapped as the best local uh, print reporter. Um, that, and they never told us ahead of being published, that, you know, things like that. That was a secret that the publisher kept. On a Wednesday in October 2007, I won for the third year. Two days later, I was fired. And I've never been told why I was fired, because North Carolina is a right to fire state. Uh, but that was two weeks before my grand book came out, and it had already been reviewed publicly. And my surmise is that some advertisers here, this is a deeply religious area in the country, some advertisers may have gone to the publisher and said, you gotta get rid of this guy. So uh, that's my relationship with Graham <laughs> during that time. I did get to go to the opening of the Graham Library as a reporter for well, that. You know, I, wanted, I, wanted, I, I, got, I kinda got hung up on, on a couple words you just said, a deep yeah. religious area of the country. When I think about Graham, especially after learning what I'm learning from you, 
I don't see a deeply religious guy. I see a a venal a user exploiter who is using religion to serve his own purposes. Are there any signs that he was a narcissist or a psychopath or any of those kinds of things? Hmm. I, I don't have a, a, a basis for an opinion on that, but I know that he, that money and the attendant power were important to him. For instance, here's a, for instance, um, early on in the fifties, a, a wealthy industrialist, the name evades me right now, but came to him and said, Billy, I want to back your next crusade. And Billy said, Oh, oh no. He said, if, if I have a big backer like you, people will stop sending in $1 and $5 in their little envelopes every week. Uh, and I, this is a quote, I don't have it off the top of my head, but he, he said this and, and it, it's recorded. Um, I don't want to put them, those donors off, but maybe you could underwrite this new movie project I have. And so he opened his wide world pictures with money from that industrialist, but he continued to get his $1 and his $5 from his orders. Um, he was, he was never as blatant as some of the later money, the, uh, in, the uh, wealth pros pros prosperity gospel ministers who, who made it very clear you need to send them thousands of dollars, you know, to, but he was very, he, he never, nevertheless made it clear that supporting his ministry would help get you a place in heaven. And $1 and $5 and $10 adds up. In fact, <laughs> when he first started out, he, he, uh, one of his first big crusades was in, I think it was Washington state. They, they passed the hat. They did the fleece, they called it. I mean, we, we think of fleecing, I think of fleecing somebody as cheating them. Yeah. He happily called it the fleece. And after the fleece, they had over $10,000. This is in 1949, I think. Wow. In the box. And they realized they better open a bank account <laughs> and, and become a nonprofit. And so the paperwork happened all of a sudden after that. But, uh, yeah, he, he ended up with multi-millions of dollars in that. Mm -hmm. You're breaking uh, up again. A little. In the military? Uh, okay. Okay. He, he ended up with millions of dollars, you were saying. Hundreds of millions of dollars invested in, in arms manufacturers, in oil companies, uh, just a vast amount of money. And, and uh, during the last years that I had data for when I wrote the book, which was in 2000, the book came out in 07, I think it was 2004, 2005. He took home 525,000 from, uh, from the association. Well, you need that to maintain a log cabin. I know, and that's on top of all the perks he got. You know, if you get to ride in the, in the presidential yacht, you don't need to buy a yacht. Yeah, and you know, I'm sure you think the, the, his organization paid for his limos as well. Um, I'm sure. And here, it's funny, here in, in Asheville and in Buncombe County, he has very mixed reviews. During my research for that book, I talked to a number of older African-American people in town here who still, in 2006, resented Billy Graham for his, uh, his separatist position, for his uh, um, segregationist crusades here. When he finally let them in, they had to sit in the balcony. They couldn't sit with the white folks. Um, his you father in law. You're talking about his church? No, this was in the in the civic center. Uh, no, these are the tens of thousands of people. They still the blacks couldn't sit with the whites. Um, his wife Ruth's father was a well known John Bircher and a suspected KKK member here in Asheville. Uh, his connections to white separate or to the segregationist movement were very very strong. And it wasn't until well after Brown that he finally integrated, permitted integration of you his. Broke up, you broke up again and you started to say it wasn't until well after. Could you start that again? Sure. It wasn't until well after Brown versus the Board of Education when the zeitgeist was moving toward integration that he began to permit integrated uh, crowds at his crusades. He was a, wow. pretty much a follower of, of, of the popular will. He was never a leader. 
So I'm, I'm really interested in his influence on the current hyper aggressive political nature of evangelical Christianity today. Can you kind of dig into that a little bit more? Sure. He, um, he led the way, as I said before, in, into intruding religion into government. Now, that's the word you've used a couple of times, intruding. That's not the usual word that is used. Uh, so what do you mean by intruding religion into government? Well, uh, for instance, Truman didn't want to meet with him, but he got a congressman to convince Truman to let him show up. Um, and he, he went in and uh, went down on a knee and was praying for Truman and all this sort of stuff. And then when he left the White House, he, he and his crew, he had three or four people with him, reenacted what they'd done with Truman, uh, saying that Truman had prayed with them and all this sort of thing, which Truman denied later. But they made it, he, made it, he immediately made it a media thing. And then he, he got permission, again through congressmen who were friends, to hold an event on the, on the White House steps. He, he then worked with uh, the anti-communist angle through McCarthy, with McCarthy, and, and pushed for the idea that since it was godless communism, we needed to put in God we trust on our money. That hadn't happened before that time. He pushed for inc inclusion of one nation under God into the Pledge of Allegiance. That hadn't happened until then. Wow. And, and one step after another, uh, going to the, um, creating the presidential prayer breakfasts, which at, once it became popular, no president dared avoid, you know, because of the big block of Christians who were, who were worked. So it was a step at a time until finally, well, as, as recently as the, uh, it was the 2012 election, I think, where Billy Graham signed a, a full page ad in the New York Times condemning gay marriage, um, um, really taking a strong political stance against uh, Obama and, and in favor of, of his uh, opponent. So, I mean, he, he was always more subtle than the more strident evangelicals. Maybe he was more politic. Maybe he understood that he had to take that the soft path and not the hard edge, but it didn't keep others uh, from following that hard edge. I mean, as he's, he sort of softened it up in my view. You know, he wasn't the leader of it, but he was, he was the, maybe the thought leader of it. So what do modern uh, evangelical political operatives do that he set in motion and kind of created besides the prayer breakfast, which, I mean, most people probably don't even think of that as a political event, but it is totally one, I think. Sure. Well, for instance, his, his very famous uh, uh, turning over his lists to Nixon's uh, uh, campaign. I mean, he had, Graham had a much wider reach. If you think back then, today we think of email. I mean, personally, I have 70,000 emails in my email list because um, I ran for Congress uh, six years ago. But, um, and that didn't happen back in 1968. Every, every couple of months, I delete about 30, 40,000 to get it down <laughs> under 400,000. Uh, yeah, yeah. So you know what I mean. That, that, but that's now. Back then, finding ways to contact a wide swath of people for a campaign was much more complicated. And for him to turn over his contacts across the country to a campaign was amazing. He also arranged to get a group of black ministers in to meet Nixon. Uh, and Nixon made promises that were never kept to that group. Um, so he worked it and he worked it and he worked it. Um, and, and he would give his tacit approval. He allowed Nixon, to, in fact, right the week after Kent State, when National Guardsmen shot down a bunch of students at, at Kent State University in Ohio, and the nation was mourning. Uh, there was huge difficulty about the Vietnam War at that point. I mean, it had a really aroused anti-Vietnam fervor. Uh, Graham had a crusade and invited Nixon to the stage to address the group. And he, he talked about what a great job Nixon was doing in Vietnam. Uh, 
So he was giving his imprimatur to the presidents over and over again. He stood beside George Bush uh, when George Bush declared war from the National Cathedral uh, after 9-1-1. Graham was at his right hand. Uh, so he's always, he's, he's, he's given his approval, but never necessarily led in the way that some of our more recent um, Christian evangelists have, like Franklin, his son, is outspokenly pro-Republican. I mean, he's beyond any, I mean, there's no question. He's, he, he acts as, an, as a Republican in the public sphere. How, how, what are the similarities and differences between Franklin and Billy Graham? <laughs> uh, Franklin's a lot more brash. Uh, in, his, uh, in his youth, he was known around here, and I had interviews with people who knew of him here because they lived 15 miles from Nashville here. Uh, he rode his motorcycle. He sped through the city, and the police would chase him, and he'd get through the gates of the, of the family compound and have the gates slammed shut behind him. Um, he was known as a kind of a libertine. He, he spent a lot of time, he got a job through his dad to deliver some trucks from Europe to somewhere in the Mideast. And he and a friend cut a swath through Europe, uh, drinking and partying as they drove these trucks down to wherever they had to deliver them. He was, he was just a real wild card. He brags in his own autobiography about cutting down a tree with an automatic weapon because he wanted to see if he could do it. And he has a reputation up in Boone, North Carolina, which was the headquarters of his Samaritan's Purse. It's where Appalachian State University is, um, that he'd invite the, the men's ball teams out to his property to shoot holes in, uh, in junk cars. They use automatic weapons to blast junk cars on his property, and the neighbors all complained about the noise. He's a, he's a very uh, grandiosely aggressive sort of person, but at some point in his I think late twenties, early thirties, his dad sat him down and said, "Hey, you got to get right here." And he again, Franklin says in his autobiography, "I saw then what my calling was." that I was going to join, I was going to be in the ministry. So I went back to college and got a business degree. That's exactly what he said. <laughs> and he's, he, he makes way more money than his dad ever did. He's much more of a businessman. Billy was a great salesman. Franklin's a good businessman. And so what are some of his side gigs that make him money? Well, he had Samaritan's Purse, which was the the charity that was doing very well on its own um, and was involved in transporting Bibles to, as I mentioned earlier, to the Mideast. And allegedly, I couldn't, you can't find records of this, but some of some connections there claim that he ran guns for people like the Contras. Um, I don't know who got paid for what there, but now he's taken over the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association with vast holdings. Now let's talk about that. And I just need to do a station ID. This is the Rob Call Bottom Up Show, available on Pacifica Radio and Progressive Radio Network, on iTunes, on Stitcher, on SoundCloud, on Google Podcasts. It's sponsored by OpEdNews.com. And I'm speaking with <coughs> Cyril Bothwell. He's the author of The Prince of War, Billy Graham's Crusade for a Holy Christian Empire. He's an award-winning investigative reporter who spent a lot of years researching Billy Graham. And he just did an op-ed, uh, a kind of an obituary on Billy Graham that uh, we've published on opednews.com. So tell us about the resources of Graham's son. Well, it's hard to know exactly where the money comes from. One of the things that Franklin Graham did that the Billy Graham Association did not do is uh, uh, Franklin Graham very quickly when he formed Samaritan's Purse set up other in, uh, nonprofit corporations in Europe and Canada and he passed uh, money between the organizations making the money trail very hard to follow. In the US it's fairly easy to see nonprofit receipts in that even for the for nonprofit organizations, churches are completely opaque. Uh, churches don't have to file anything. 
but nonprofits do have to make filings. So the money in the U.S. is visible, but the money in Canada and Europe is not. And um, Samaritan's Purse, for instance, claimed to fund, you can, the title itself, Samaritan's Purse, sort of suggests that this is money for, for good Samaritan works. I mean, that's what the, the suggestion is. Right. And one of the things I tracked back then, and again, this is 10 years ago that I wrote the book, so I can't tell you a whole lot about current finances, but money that was given to the U.S. organization, supposedly for food for a third world country, was transferred to Canada and then disappeared. Uh, and maybe it was transferred to Europe, but to, to determine whether any rice was ever purchased is very, very complicated. Um, and then no telling what Franklin's getting these days for his political activities. He's been very visible in recent years as an anti-Muslim spokesperson. Uh, he all but endorsed the uh, birther people uh, when Trump and others were claiming that Obama was born in Kenya. Um, Franklin's just, uh, he's an, he comes off in his public appearances as a very angry person. Um, but, I mean, he was raised by his father, and uh, some, uh, he, again, in his autobiography, Franklin's autobiography was one of the more revealing personal glimpses I got of, of Billy. Uh, for one, one time, they were out at the compound there in Montreat, North Carolina, which is surrounded by college property, Montreat College, and uh, there are hiking trails up on the hills. And... Uh, Billy and his son were shooting a 22 rifle at a tar at targets and they heard a gunshot up on the mountain and Billy turned and fired up and up into them up the mountain with his gun. Uh, really weird. I mean, what? And, and then when he was at, he was at a college, uh, the Bible college in Florida, Billy reports that he, uh, let's see. He was taking care of the dean's house while the dean was away. And this is in Billy Graham's autobiography. I mean, these guys are not even afraid to say what they did. He was taking care of the dean's house. And some other students came and were heckling him from outside the door. And he fired a gun through the door at the hecklers outside. Billy says this in his autobiography, just as I am. You can't make this stuff up. <laughs> You're kind of answering my question about the uh, narcissists and psychopaths side of things. Yeah, yeah. And apples don't fall far from the tree. Their, their public demeanor is different. Franklin's demeanor is a lot more aggressive than his father was. Although his father, in his early preaching, was a pretty aggressive preacher. He, he talked about going after the audience with his verbal sword and cutting to their hearts. And, and uh, he, he, was, he was quite a showman too, as far as that went. Again, which contributed in the early years of TV, you think he was competing against Milton Berle and Ed Sullivan for TV time, and he was the kind of the wild preacher. Well, he was clearly predatory, yep. clearly charismatic, uh, aggressive and exploitive, Yeah, uh, willing to hurt people, Absolutely. Man, you start putting together the profile of this guy. And one of the reasons I want to interview you is because I've been thinking about just where the evangelical church has gone in recent years, where they have twisted who they are and, twist, I think, twisted Christianity to a point where it, the people who are supporting the NRA— and Trump, and the kind of policies that are uh, getting rid of all protections for the environment and for workers, it, it comes down to it's, it's evil. I mean, and, and, you know, I'm not a big religious person, but when you see them doing all these things, it's hard to understand how that can be put into the context of Jesus Christ's teachings. Exactly so. And in both... Any political party has its foibles, but it seems to me that liberals in America, broadly speaking, are much more emblematic of what we're told Jesus taught 
<laughs> I mean, the idea of taking care of the poor, of the least among us, of turning the other cheek. The NRA is not about turning the other cheek. It's about dropping him before he drops you. About cutting down trees with guns, my God. Here's an interesting element um, that is reflected in today's Me Too movement is when, when uh, Bill Clinton was going through the Monica Lewinsky business, Billy Graham came to his defense and his words were, I know how difficult it is. Oh, <laughs> what's, what's difficult? Working with young interns? <laughs> I don't know, but he, that's how he defended Clinton. I know how difficult it is. Any, any peccadilloes or history that came up with Billy Graham? No, no. He, uh, he, as far as I can see, as far as I could determine from reading, again, everything I get my hands on and interviewing anybody who talked to me, he was pretty straightforward. I mean, I, I think that part of it, I don't think he, uh, I don't think there were any sexual, there were no sexual escapades that were in any way visible. No Jimmy Swaggart then. No, no. Although he spent an awful lot of time away from home. He, he yeah. was on the road constantly. And, you know, I, but that doesn't imply anything. What about his treatment? Of money, what, but I don't see that he cheated to get the money. What about, to, what about his treatment of women, his attitude towards women and their role in society? Um, he, his, his opinion about that, I don't know about his personal treatment of people, but his opinion about clearly stated over and over again was that God made women subservient to men, that women had to obey their husbands. He, he spoke out strongly about that in his crusades. So now whether that was tempered over the years, um, I, I don't know for sure about that part of it, but he, he was explicit. And a lot of women were upset with him about that. Well, they should be. Yeah, yeah. So he kind of disappeared in the last couple of years. Uh, I guess, you know, he, he just passed. He was 99, I guess. Was he in full mental capacity up until the end? What, what do you know about his last years? What I heard uh, just during this postmortem is that he was in and out of consciousness during this last year. Uh, I know that his public appearances over the last 10 years were brief and he, he seemed enfeebled certainly he, he wasn't speaking publicly he apparently had parkinson's which i know is debilitating and in the end i believe he had cancer and heart problems in addition to that so for at least 10 years and at least 10 years he's been off the stage and before that he was easing out but age will do that to anyone you really had to dust off that obituary eh? <laughs> yeah well again it's a uh because I had written so extensively about him, because I knew that once when he died, he was going to be thoroughly whitewashed. I mean, he was whitewashed along the way, but it seemed to me all of a sudden, all of his glory was going to be the story. And the truth that I had discovered about him, or the truths I believe I discovered, were going to disappear down the whole of history. So I wrote the obituary. I composed it early and figured when, it, when the time came, I was ready with it. So what have you seen in terms of the obituaries that have been written about him in the last days? Uh, were you right? Have they whitewashed his history? Is he being uh, noted as a hero and a wonderful person? Is, are any of the mainstream media actually reporting on what you know is the truth about him? Only passingly, for instance, uh, some reports I've heard mention that he, the little dust up about the, his comments about the Jews, but then they, they say, of course, he immediately apologized and said he didn't, you know, he doesn't know why that happened, blah, blah, blah. But that's, and, that, and they constantly say that he wasn't political, that he avoided politics, that he didn't get involved in politics, and that is completely false. Um, that sort of goes to the, there was a, the Time Magazine put out a book about him, uh, the preacher and the presidents around the early 2000s, 2005, somewhere in there. Um, and they totally polished that apple. 
as if he had been counseling the presidents, uh, that he was called in for their spirit to, for spiritual advice. And, and, and so that's coming out again in these, in these uh, obituaries. They're saying, oh, he was the preacher to the presidents. He, he, they, they depended on him for spiritual advice. And yet there's nothing in the written record except for his own version that suggests that he was anything but a political operator, working for his own benefit, working to get credentials uh, to get into countries. Um, of course, the appearances, simply appearing with presidents, bolstered his image as a preacher. I wonder what a, an appearance with a president is worth to a televangelist preacher. Must be worth a, a lot of money because, you know, it, it's the imprimatur. It's, it's like, I don't know, the, kissing the Pope's ring, I guess. It's, it's really, uh, it, it brands him as a reliable preacher, as, as America's preacher. And, and even that's a phrase that's being used in his obituaries, America's preacher. But what would you say, kissing up to all those presidents and working so hard using members of Congress to get access to the presidents, how would you say that that really reflects on who he is and what kind of person he was? I think he was uh, an expert showman, and he knew that that contact with presidents would redound to his benefit. And he worked every way he could to get invitations to the White House for that reason. He was first and foremost a performer who knew how to work the audience. An interesting hustler, hustler comes to mind. Yeah. Um, a sidebar here is, is that uh, when I was running for election in 2009, a, uh, a, a voter came up to my campaign manager and said, I'm not voting for Bothwell. He said Billy was influenced by Adolf Hitler. And she said, well, have you read the book? And he said, I don't have to. And she said, well, I have. And uh, that was drawn from Billy Graham's autobiography, in which he said he watched movies of Adolf Hitler to learn how to work a crowd. Even wow. though he didn't speak German, he watched how he worked up the, you know, Hitler was magnificent at working up a crowd and Billy studied movies of Hitler and that's all I reported in my book but that's the sign of a person learning to be a showman in my view not a person learning to, to preach whatever gospel one wants to preach well, well he went way beyond well, just preaching gospel yeah, yeah I would I would I would also think that the uh other thing that the benefit of getting in front of all those presidents or with those presidents is it would set him up for all these businesses that he created overseas as well. Oh, certainly. The, the, the sort of influence that uh, Paul Manafort ha has had in recent years, up until very recently, uh, the connections that the high government creates um, means that if, if, if he befriends the president and the, and the White House and congressman, and then he, and then he gets to ride on a government plane. To Which he did a lot of. You, you, you write about that, Hal. He routinely hitched rides on all kinds of government uh, airplanes. And jets. Right, and then he lands in a foreign country, and he meets with, always with the elected officials and with the important people, the big financiers and everything in those countries, they're likely to see him as uh, a, a bit of influence with the U.S. government. And maybe they're going to support his crusade, or maybe they're going to invest in his movie company, or maybe they're going to help him set up um, uh, some kind of a, a church or whatever, some kind of ministry in the country. Uh, it's certainly, there's an influence peddling element to all of that. It, it, it makes me think of, Trump's family members who are working in the White House and how they're exploiting so much more connection and exposure in building business around the world. Right. And of course, the difference to the popular, in a popular opinion is, well, Trump, that's a business. But Billy, he was preaching. <laughs> well, that was his business. And he's, he, he died being worth hundreds of millions of dollars, you've said. 
his, his ministry certainly was. Now, what he personally holds, I, I don't know that. Um, uh, the property I know he held was the log cabin with the indoor pool and the golf villa um, and the suits that people gave him and whatever limousines and I guess the helicopter. I, I don't know about that. But so much of what he relied on was owned by the ministry. It's, it's a... It's one of the weird things about American government is, is we exempt so much religious activity from taxation and from oversight that it's very difficult to know what the wherewithal is of religious figures. Well, you know, I, I call my show the bottom-up show because I think we're transitioning from a predominantly top-down culture to a more bottom-up one. And, and I've, I've, I've done one interview about bottom-up religion. It, it seems like Billy Graham is an example of uh, one of the most top-down religious operations and organizations in modern history. Certainly so. When he would go into a town to do a, to do a, a crusade, there was an advanced team that would go into the town and organize local churches who were agreeable um, and get them to sell tickets or, or to maybe they weren't sold tickets, but they were, however, to get people to, to, to show up at the event, uh, he would recruit, they would recruit local choirs to be part of the event. There was a whole advanced team, very much like a modern political campaign, a presidential campaign that might go into a town and organize ahead of a presidential appearance there. Wow. And uh, I talked to people who worked for him and with, not for him personally, but for his organization. And they said it was very slick, very well organized. Um, they just knew exactly, they hit the ground with the ads, with the contacts, with everything. And so it was really built up, prepared for his, his arrival in town. And his arrival would end up being in some kind of a big arena or something? Right. Um, tens of thousands of people, uh, you know, stadiums, that sort of, that size sort of events. And they would give money at those events, those tens of thousands of people? Yeah, they would fleece the people at the events. <laughs> that's and that's their language, not mine. Yeah. It's, I guess the fleece maybe at some point in the in the past had some religious connotation, you know, the fleece of a sheep or something. But in modern part, fleecing someone is stealing. Or well, you just, them. Yes, we just lost. We just had a freeze again. Um, so you, you you were talking about the fleece. Could you 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 sure. say about the history of the fleece again? Right. Uh, I'm sure that in, there must be some history of fleece in a positive sense for religion. It may have something to do with a fleece of a sheep. I, I don't I don't know the source, but it seems to me for modern English speakers. When we talk about a fleece, we're talking about conniving. We're talking about fooling people into parting with their money. Where did you come up with hearing that phrase from them? Was that in your listening? In, in, in Billy Graham's books, in his, uh, in his sermons, the, the fleece. So he, he, it was a public thing. He used that oh, word. Yeah, I, yeah it, was, it was a positive to him. Positive. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting. And it made a lot of money. And then he had them come forward and... and accept Jesus and all that sort of thing. So we're, we're down to the last two minutes of the show. Anything you want to wrap up with? I just want to give your website again. Uh, your, your, your website is CecilBothwell.com. C-E-C-I-L-B-O-T-H-W-E-L-L.com. Anything you want to wrap with? Well, I think it's really important that we learn who is writing our histories and, and that we examine big figures in our culture to really to understand what they really did. And it's, that's the job of historians. And often they do a good job. Sometimes it takes a long time after the passing of someone before their whole story comes out. Well, it, fortunately you've been here to help us to get a clearer picture of just who Billy Graham was. Uh, you've been listening. Well, You've been listening to Cecil Bothwell. He's the author of Prince of War, Billy Graham's Crusade for a Holy Christian Empire. This is the Rob Call Bottom Up Show, sponsored by opednews.com, available on Pacifica Radio, Progressive Radio Network, Stitcher, iTunes, uh, and SoundCloud, and more. Uh, 
thanks for being here. Cecil, thank you. Glad to be here. Thank you for having me. Appreciate it.